All praise, glory and adoration be to the most holy name, the creator of all, the most high and awesome God. Amen. Beloved, last time we briefly heard about Emperor Emmanuel Church's teaching about the family. Or we briefly saw the teachings of the messenger who was sent by God. From the time that Emperor Emmanuel Church has been established, those who are against the Sadwarta, the good news, against the messenger sent by God to proclaim this Sadwarta, the good news, have propagated false claims that Zion destroys family relationships. This is done mostly by the Christian churches without knowing what is preached in Zion or by those who have misunderstood what was spoken through the word of God. Beloved, we have already seen that when God established a family, he had many plans in mind and all that was written in the Holy Bible. God made these plans known to the teachings of the prophets, to the spirit of the wisdom, through his beloved son, Jesus Christ, and through the apostles. And nothing apart from this has been taught or preached in Zion because Emperor Emmanuel Church submits 100% before the word of God. Zion has not peddled the word of God, nor adulterated it. No, and will never do it because the word of God is God. And even the Almighty God is subjected to the written word of God because God cannot deny himself. For this reason, Emperor Emmanuel Church gives the utmost importance to the Holy Scriptures. Therefore, the only church which is completely governed by the word of God is Emperor Emmanuel Church. Beloved, a marriage is a bond, a relationship that is established through by a covenant and God stands as a witness to this covenant. Therefore, the Bible testifies that those who commit adultery are violating this covenant. When is an individual set free from this covenant? Let's read in the book of Romans chapter 7 verse 1 to 3. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only during the person's lifetime. Thus, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. So we see that from this covenant called marriage, which is a covenant bound by the law, an individual is set free only if the spouse dies. In this case, when the spouse has died, this person is no longer bound by this covenant. Therefore, after death, this relationship has no longer exist. But this is not applicable to a divorce. Beloved, contrary to the accusations made, divorces are not carried out in Zion. Because in Zion, the system of divorce does not exist. What's the reason for this? Because God himself opposes divorce. Rather, he hates it. We read in Malachi chapter 2, verse 13 to 16. And this you do as well. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor at your hand. You ask, why does he not? Because the Lord was a witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, 
though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did not one God make her? Both flesh and spirit are his. And what does the one God desire? Godly offspring. So look to yourselves and do not let anyone be faithless to the wife of his youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and covering one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to yourselves and do not be faithless. So the word of God is clearly teaching us that God hates divorce. And the same is taught in Zion as well. Because the Bible clearly testifies that God has created husband and wife as one body and one spirit. Therefore, what is the main objective of this? To bring forth godly offspring or children devoted to God. In other words, to ensure that all children of God placed in Adam be born on this earth and partake of the goodness of God's creation. So God hates the act that destroys a family, a family that has been established to fulfill this objective. Therefore, Zion will never encourage divorce and has never done so before. However, we see an incident that occurred long before the time of Jesus Christ that is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. They said to him, Why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her? He said to them, It was because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives but from the beginning, it was not so. So some laws were given only because of the hardness of heart of the people who lived during those times. Therefore, we see that when Jesus Christ came, he brought changes into them and fulfilled those laws. So among the commandments that God had given through Moses, we see that Jesus Christ edified and fulfilled the commandments right from the second to the tenth. The same is with the covenant of marriage. Jesus Christ has clearly taught us that divorce is not in accordance with the will of God. Rather, he hates it. Therefore, it is the will of God that those who have been united by God must not separate. But the word of God also teaches us about certain exceptions wherein divorces is permitted. We read in Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. So apart from unchastity and unfaithfulness, if anyone forsakes their spouse and marries another, they commit adultery. Now, although the Lord does permit divorce on the grounds of unchastity, yet it is the same Lord who has said that if a brother or a sister sins against you and then pleads for forgiveness, you must forgive him wholeheartedly. You must forgive limitlessly. So, in this situation, our Lord has not encouraged divorce. Rather, he teaches us that we must forgive and that a woman should be more submissive towards a husband. Why? Because all barriers can be removed when one forgives from the heart. Beloved, it is for this reason that there should be some evidence of unchastity. Otherwise, just out of jealousy or because one is having an extramarital affair, if they accuse their spouse of unchastity, that is no reason or basis for a divorce. Therefore, Jesus Christ has taught us that only on this basis there is a possibility of divorce. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 to 15. To the married I give this command, 
not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband. And this is precisely what Zion teaches, that the husband must not separate from his wife, and the wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does separate, let her remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband, and that her husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I am not the Lord, that if any believer has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. But today, people won't comprehend this because of this modern generation. A person's beliefs are not relevant. Faith has no significance in today's world. It is no longer essential. No one has faith. This is a generation that cannot spare a thought for God. A generation where God has no place in their lives. Today, if these people are told that an unbelieving wife must live with a husband, then it is not a big deal because this is a faithless generation. If a woman has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she should not separate from him. This is what the Word of God teaches us because an unbelieving wife is sanctified through a husband and an unbelieving husband through his wife. This is what the scriptures testify. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. So whether it's an unbelieving husband or an unbelieving wife, if their spouse is a true believer, their marriage is holy. And if they have children, they are also holy. The Holy Bible affirms this. And this is precisely what is taught in Zion. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. So here we see that God gives his consent. If the unbelieving spouse wishes to separate, let it be so. Therefore, what happens? In such a case, the brother or a sister is not bound. The bond of marriage between them gets abolished. The covenant of marriage between them becomes null and void. But all this is written only for those who have been joined together by the Lord. This is not applicable to those who have been joined by humans and especially not to those who have been united by Satan. So the scriptures clearly testify that if an unbelieving spouse wishes to separate, on doing so, the bond of marriage will no longer exist between them. And this is exactly what is preached in Zion. Therefore, beloved, what are the circumstances wherein the covenant of marriage can be annulled are clearly mentioned in the Bible. And the same is what is preached in Zion. And now examine the deeds of those churches that have accused Zion of destroying family relationships. Examine all the prominent churches of this world. If you calculate the number of divorces that are conducted in the churches today, the results are appalling. And yet, these places that encourage divorces accuse Zion of destroying families where divorces are not carried out at all. The families that are destroyed by divorce are not destroyed by Zion, but by those prominent churches who accuse Zion. Beloved, examine the deeds of these churches that are destroying the divine system of a family. If we would just open our eyes and look around us carefully, we will be able to see so many incidents taking place in churches today that are destroying families. And it is the so-called leaders of these churches that are doing these deeds. In the book of Genesis, we can see that in the beginning itself, God created our first parents. And the scriptures testify that he gave shape to the soil and breathed life into their nostrils. But today, 
People cannot accept this. They believe that the human race took form through the evolution of monkeys. In this manner, even the church authorities have accepted that humans have evolved from apes. And many Bible scholars have agreed to this. But if humans are born of apes, then where does a system of family emerge? Where did God establish a family? Therefore, when church authorities preach that humans have originated from apes, then they have mindlessly also admitted that God never established a family. So, it is the leaders of the churches, Bible scholars, priests and the gospel preachers that are denying this divine truth that it is God who instituted a family. And it is because of them that the divine system of a family is getting destroyed. On the other hand, Zion has preached that it is God who created humankind and joined the first parents and established them as a family. At that time, God has many plans in mind concerning this family. And it, it is only in Zion that it is revealed that this plan is concerning the restoration of this family. But we see that it is these churches that deny that God established the system of a family who are now destroying the families. We read in Hosea chapter 4 verse 4 to 8. Yet let no one contend and let none accuse for with you is my contention, O priest. Therefore, O priest, it is God who is accusing you. The more they increased, the more they sinned against me. They changed their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. What does this mean? Beloved, to the people are wallowing in sin and the priests are glad to have it this way. You can read about many such incidents through the media. There is a vast history of priests who use the sacrament of confession to manipulate women, exploit them to gratify their flesh and in this manner they have destroyed many families. Then there's also a vast case history of church leaders and counselors who under the guise of family counseling indulge in illicit relationships and destroy many families. But a very small number of these cases have come to light. Just as a huge iceberg that is submerged in the ocean, but just a tip of it is visible in the same manner out of the vast majority of these evil deeds, only a fraction has surfaced to the today's media. People are still not speaking out about such incidents out of their fear of being humiliated before others and losing their family. So under the guise of confession and counseling, they are destroying families, exploiting the vulnerable and are profiting of the sins of the people. This is not happening in Zion, but in all the prominent churches that are falsely accusing Zion. And the cases that are slowly coming to light are proof of this. Beloved, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 34, 1 and 2, we read, The word of the Lord came to me, mortal, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Now we must not presume that all this has already been fulfilled during the time of prophet Ezekiel. This is a prophecy that is very significant in the end times. Prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, you shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? Again, in the same chapter, verse 9 and 10, we read, Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. If you read the entire chapter of Ezekiel chapter 34, 
you will hear the heartbreaking lamentation and the pain of a father who has witnessed his flock being abused and crushed by the very shepherds he had appointed to take care of them. Thus says the Lord God, I am against the shepherds. So, whom is God against? The shepherds. And I will demand my sheep at their hand. And the one who is going to take an account of the lost sheep, the one who will rule all the nation with an iron rod, the righteous judge, Emperor Emmanuel, has already come to this earth. These shepherds exercise their authority and wealth to blind humans and to cover up their faults, but they won't be able to cover up before God. He has kept a strict account of all their deeds and the scriptures clearly testify that we all have to give an account before him. And the Lord says, I will put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths so that they may not be food for them. Beloved, under the guise of providing financial help and other so-called outstretched programs, many church authorities and leaders have destroyed families, pretending to help they have interfered in family matters, causing instability, conflicts, uneasiness, and establishing illicit relationships. Thus, they are the root cause of the tears of many families. These are some of the testimonies of their victims that have come to light. Therefore, it is the authorities of the various churches that are truly destroying families. As we read in Mika chapter 2, verse 9, The women of my people you drive out from their pleasant houses. From their young children you take away my glory forever. Beloved, in the past few decades, we have been hearing about many news reports about pedophilia, such reports about priests and bishops who have professed celibacy, abusing children have surfaced in various countries. Many countries set up investigation committees wherein many were found guilty of these crimes. However, in reality, this is just a fraction of the actual number of cases. By abusing so many children in this manner, they have destroyed many families. The children who faced this abuse at such a tender age were scarred for life and they suffered mental anguish, instability and a lack of peace in their families throughout their adult lives. What is the reason for this? The church authorities that were entrusted with the duty of protecting and nurturing these children but who abused and misused them are the culprits. Therefore, it is the authorities present in today's churches who are destroying families and abusing children, not Zion. The scripture further states that the women of my people you drive out from their pleasant houses. Why does the scripture say this? Just take a closer look at the establishment run by today's churches. From medical colleges to orphanages to marriage bureaus. If you closely examine the condition of the children who are contained within these establishments, you would know the truth. The church authorities claim they have built these establishments to serve Jesus Christ. Ask any of the children in these orphanages or colleges how they have experienced God or what have they learned about Jesus Christ. Do these children step out of these establishment with any hope in Jesus Christ? Is it truly out of love for God that they are sent to these establishments? The greatest promise Jesus Christ has given us is eternal life. Do these children walk out of these church establishments with any hope in the promise of eternal life? What is eternal life? How do we receive it? What do we need to do to attain it? Do these children know 
anything about this when they graduate from these religious institutions but they do not receive any knowledge concerning eternal life or even about the kingdom of God they are only taught about how to live a good life on this earth how to get qualified for a good job how to make a good name in society and be praised by the world how to become successful in this world this is the only training that is given in these establishments and then what's the result of this all are lost in the rat race trying to go abroad to prosperous nation seeking better prospects the system of a family no longer exists families are now scattered but in zion it is taught that a husband and wife must always stay together they must love one another they must spend time with each other must eat together and most importantly they must pray together and zion has not founded any such establishments that are destroying families it is the other churches of this world that are doing so therefore the word of god states that the women of my people you drive out from their pleasant houses from their young children you take away my glory forever so who are the ones that are destroying families beloved the churches that are accusing zion of breaking families in reality are themselves committing a very shallow deed the deed of destroying god's dream that he had in mind concerning a family and of causing obstacles in all the plans god had of establishing this family in the garden of eden god had said it is not good that a man should be alone i will make him a helper as his partner jesus christ did not amend the scripture neither did the apostles but in all the prominent churches of this world you will find those who have disregarded the scripture they are the self proclaimed celibates who abstain from marriage but what they do not comprehend is that by doing so they are obstructing god's plan in bringing forth the children of god that were placed in adam into this world in the holy scriptures we see it is written that even a bishop must marry only once and we have already seen when is that time when the scripture that states if you are unmarried do not seek marriage has to be fulfilled nowadays bible scholars are preaching that paul wrote it in this way because the people of those times had mistakenly presumed that christ would come back quickly but it is not so before the appointed time nowhere in the bible is it written that one should abstain from marriage therefore all the institutions that have been established by self proclaimed celibates who are refraining from marriage have not been established by god as we read in matthew chapter 19 11 and 12 but he said to them not everyone can accept this teaching but only those to whom it is given now we know the reason all those who didn't receive grace from god to understand this couldn't accept it for there are eunuchs who have been so from birth and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of god let anyone accept this who can so this is clearly means that those who cannot accept this won't even understand it therefore god has to grant divine wisdom and the gift to understand the secrets of the kingdom of god and only those who receive these gifts will be able to comprehend these instructions till now people have been misinterpreting the scripture many believe that this scripture instructs you to not get married but here the word eunuch does not represent an unmarried individual and neither is it someone who is born neither male nor a female 
All this is fully revealed only through the service of Sadhuvartha, the good news. Who are those who are born as eunuchs? Who are those who have been made eunuchs by humans? And why would anyone want to become a eunuch for the kingdom of God? What have we learned about the kingdom of God till date? We have only been hearing about a kingdom that accepts those who live a good life on earth. So to enter this kingdom, where is it written that one must refrain from marriage? Quite a few who have been declared as saints by the Catholic churches itself are married. Therefore, even in the Holy Bible, you will not find any teaching that forbids marriage in order to enter the kingdom of God and neither is it a criteria to lead others into the kingdom of God. So which kingdom of God is this referring to? If you read and understand this, only then will you understand the meaning of this scripture. And if that is to be understood, then one has to receive the gift to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. Those who have not comprehended these things have caused a significant delay in the fulfillment of the plans of God. The plan that God had in mind when he created his children in the Garden of Eden. Similarly, there is another scripture which is conjoined with a scripture and misinterpreted. Revelations chapter 14 verse 4. It is these who who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Hence, people jump to this conclusion that those who refrain from marriage are virgins and this is a common notion that only priests and nuns are the virgins that are mentioned here. But this is not what the scripture states. It doesn't say that they have not defiled themselves without a woman. Rather, it says they have not defiled themselves with women. Now, if a man gets defiled when he unites with a woman, who's to be blamed for it? Isn't it God who is the cause of it? Because in the Garden of Eden, it is God who joined them. It was he who gave the woman as a suitable mate, as a partner to Adam. And what about these self-proclaimed undefiled virgins? How were they conceived in the womb? Isn't it because a man united with a woman? If by uniting in marriage one would get defiled, then would not their offspring also be defiled? So when it says that they have not defiled themselves with women, it doesn't mean that they refrain from marriage. On the contrary, it means that they have united with a spouse chosen by God and have not defiled themselves by committing adultery and have lived their life in sanctity. So it's very clear that because they have misunderstood the word of God, they have acknowledged themselves as the virgins or brides mentioned in the Bible. By mere self-proclamation, one does not become a virgin or a bride of Christ. As a result of their many misinterpretations of the Holy Scriptures, they have concocted, hatched up these theories as to who are virgins or celibates. And through their false preachings, they have caused obstruction in the plan of God. It is they who have attempted to destroy the plans. God had in mind about the family, not Zion. In reality, they are the ones who have scattered many families. If you examine this while standing on God's side, you will clearly be able to see this. There are many churches and groups today that are accusing Emperor Emmanuel Church of destroying families. We have already seen that behind these accusations are many hidden agendas and selfish motives. Beloved, the families wherein the husbands and wife or the entire family shared a healthy relationship when they attended the Sadhwarta, the good news in Zion together, their relationship only grew stronger in their bond of love. These families that shared a good relationship 
if they, the entire family, heard the sadwarta, the good news, then there were no quarrels or problems in the family. Many a times, there were also families that were on the verge of breaking because of alcoholism or other issues like the lack of love or neglect, etc. When those who were undergoing this pain heard the sadwarta, the good news, they experienced the love of the father. When they heard about his plan for his children and filled with love and affection, they became more considerate towards their families and thus these families blossomed and their relationships improved. Many such incidents have happened in Zion. Many such families who are experiencing a lack of peace and discomfort when they attended the Sadwarta, their families, they were filled with peace and joy. And even now, they are living in harmony and would be glad to testify to this. But beloved, there are a handful of instances wherein the husband or the wife alone attended the Sadwarta and here they heard about the salvific plan of God that is being revealed in these end times and about the second coming of the Son of God. When they heard about all these things through the messenger sent by God, they believed in the Sadwarta, the good news. However, their spouses did not have any objection to this. After the Sadwarta, the good news, they noticed some changes in their spouse in terms of responsibilities and priorities. But Catholic priests, Catholic leaders and charismatic leaders began to interfere in these houses. Beloved, when these priests, pastors and leaders heard that someone had attended the Sadwarta, the good news in Zion, they would visit those houses. Then they slander and speak hateful and scandalous things against Zion and entice a spouse who has not heard the Sadwarta, who most commonly is the husband. There are many instances like this wherein the priests and the church authorities have poisoned the minds of the spouse of someone who has heard the Sadwarta. They are obviously inclined to do this because of selfish motives so as to hide their wrongdoings and to draw the attention of people away from their own wicked deeds. As a result of the mind of the spouse being poisoned by these priests and leaders, discomfort and problems arise within these families. And there have been many incidences wherein the husband who had accepted their poisonous words have kicked their wives out of their houses and the most hateful ways have even abused their own children. These incidents have taken place only because the wife heard the Sadwarta, the good news, and believed in it. She had to endure suffering and her children were also abused. Beloved, who has caused these families to be torn apart in this manner? Neither the messenger of the Sadwarta nor Zion is responsible for this. Rather, it is those who take pride in being acknowledged as Bible scholars or the anointed ones of God. Ever since the Sadwarta, the good news has been proclaimed, they have rejected it and were unable to comprehend the deeds of God. Yet, they hold fast to their arrogance they, along with many other so-called leaders, have torn apart many families. They themselves do not have families. Therefore, the only work left to them is to destroy families. Therefore, these priests and so-called celibates who are living a solitary life would never comprehend the pain of a broken family. So it's very clear that Zion has not broken any family. Beloved, in the same manner, they have committed many more abominable deeds and have sown discord and have tried to destroy families. They have been utilizing whatever means possible, the media, newspapers, whatever resources are made available to them by those who blindly follow them. 
to propagate that by believing in Emperor Emmanuel, by becoming a part of this church, by accepting Zion faith, their families get destroyed. You must recognize this deed of the evil one that he has been doing right from the beginning. He will try to deceive the children of God by whatever means possible just to prevent them from hearing the truth. For they themselves do not enter the kingdom of God and when others are going in, they stop them as well. Here we must understand that all the evil deeds that these priests are committing are actually in fulfillment of what the Son of God prophesies about them. Therefore, you can clearly see that Zion has not broken any families. But there are some instances wherein these families were already experiencing problems much before they accepted the Zion faith. They have published many videos against Zion. But if you closely examine the history of these families, then you would find out that there were disturbances in these families prior to their accepting the Zion faith, especially the husbands who have been abusive towards their wives. They have dragged their wives by their hair, punched them, spat on their faces and even kicked them. And yet they audaciously make videos and post them online hurling accusations against Zion for destroying their families. And if you examine what has been happening in these families, you will find that problems are being created not because the wife has accepted Zion faith. Rather, it's because the wife no longer wishes to participate in the evil deeds of her husband. The church representatives meet up with such husbands and poison their minds against Zion. And therefore, they do such deeds. Simply do a thorough background check and you will know the truth. We all know that in our country, we have the right to freedom of self-expression and the right to freedom of religion. Therefore, Zion cannot be held accountable if these wives who are seeking these freedom appeal to the court of law for justice. For this, only their husbands and the priests who have caused these dissensions must be held accountable. When these fundamental rights were being denied to them and they were being abused in their own houses, all that these Zion believers have done is to approach those who enforce these laws only so that they can attain the freedom of self-expression and to practice a religion of their choice. And this is not done with the intent of breaking family ties. On the contrary, it is because they desire to be joined as a family in love, in forbearance, and in forgiveness. Therefore, they seek justice from the court of law. No Zion believers have retaliated with abuses or even tried to harm those who have abused them. Neither have they sought to tarnish the reputation of their spouse by exposing their wrongdoings and evil deeds before others. Rather, these cases are brought to light by those who are against Zion, who are trying to stop Zion, these spouses along with the ones instigating them and all the establishment supporting them publicize their cases. The selfish motives of some crafty people and prominent churches are the root cause of this. Their ultimate goal is to abolish Zion completely. These people are set on maligning Zion, on making a mockery of Zion, on trying to prove that Zion is against the common good. Beloved, these people could never truly understand the plans of God that God had in mind for a family. We have already talked about the promise that Jesus Christ had given us. Before going to the Father, the promise He gave us is eternal life. When Zion declares this, those who are unable to comprehend, it scoffs at it. They claim that Emperor Emmanuel Church has rejected Jesus Christ and the salvation that is given through Him. In reality, they have not known nor understood what Jesus Christ gave 2,000 years ago. 
and what he is going to give us in his second coming. Hence, with their swollen pride, they would obviously consider what is preached in Zion to be foolishness. God undoubtedly has prepared a plan for our salvation, but no one has attained this eternal life that he promised us before he ascended to the Father. Even those who are being hailed as saints in the world have not received eternal life. Because if one has to receive eternal life, they must also attain an immortal body. For life dwells in the blood. So in order for life to dwell in the blood, the body must be immortal as well. Life indeed dwells in the blood which is to say that the one must attain a body that has no sickness, old age, that is decay and death, an eternal body free from sin. This is not achieved on the basis of a person's deed. We must be transfigured by God or we must be resurrected with an eternal body in order to achieve this. These are the only two ways to attain eternal life. And in a very little while, these are going to be fulfilled. For this reason, it is said, till now, no one has received this. Therefore, our goal must also be eternal life. As we read in Luke chapter 22, verse 29 and 30. And I confer on you, just as my father has conferred on me, a kingdom so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Do not ignore this promise presuming that 2,000 years ago Jesus Christ was speaking about the apostle. This is not about them and neither has this been fulfilled in them. Therefore God has promised us a kingdom. As we have mentioned before, this is not a spiritual existence. Rather, it is a kingdom that we must enter with a body. To sit at his table and to eat with him, we need to have a body. If you have to sit on a throne, you must have a body. God has promised to give us a kingdom that we will enter with a heavenly body. We read in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 and 28. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? Hence, it is very clear that those who came to test Jesus, who did not even believe in him, even their goal was eternal life. Today, how many Christians have this as their goal? Or how many Christians have asked themselves, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The truth is that no one has ever preached about this eternal life. He, the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. So the promise that he has given us eternal life. Therefore, in these last days to fulfill this promise, the son of God has returned to this earth. But to attain eternal life, we must obey the first commandment. That is, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. You must love him more than anyone else, more than everything. What does it mean to love God? We read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Loving God means obeying His commandments. You must obey His words above everyone else's. Be it your priest, your bishop, the pope or nuns, 
charismatic groups or even your own brothers, sisters, mother, father, friends or relatives. Above all these, if you obey only his word, then you will receive eternal life. Therefore, what happened in the Garden of Eden must serve as a warning for us. God breathed his own life into the first parents, eternal life, because God himself is eternal and he gave them the life that was dwelling within him. But what happened? They lost that eternal life. How? Because they listened to another voice rather than obeying God's word. God had commanded Adam, you must not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that is in the midst of the Garden of Eden. This was God's command. But what did Adam do? He obeyed the voice of Eve and ate the fruit. What was the result of it? They forfeited eternal life. But this eternal life has to be restored. And this is what God has promised us. So how will this be restored to us? How can we attain eternal life? Jesus Christ came 2000 years ago precisely for this purpose. To show us the way. He taught us as well as set an example before us. That by obeying the words of the Lord our God, we can attain eternal life. And it is with this conviction that he replied to the lawyer, do this and you will live. This is the example he has set before us. So because of obeying the voice of humans rather than the voice of God, we lost this eternal life. So how can this life be restored to us? We must only obey the voice of God. God had already foreseen that in the course of time, his words would be manipulated. Therefore, he ordered for his words to be written and safeguarded in a book. And it is the Holy Spirit who gathered his words and had them written down safely in this Holy Bible. In the course of time, with the advancement in science, many scribes, Bible scholars applying worldly knowledge started interpreting the Bible. In order to please the world, they have added their own interpretation to God's word. Hence, this false gospel that they are preaching out of their own mind cannot be considered as God's word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away. His words are not meant to please humans. To attain this life that dwells within God, we must obey His word. Therefore, above everyone else's words, we have to obey the voice of God. We read in Matthew chapter 20, verse 37. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The meaning of this is crystal clear. Yet people question in their hearts, why did he have to speak like this? What God has joined, no one must separate them. But those who get offended by this scripture question it because they have not known that above everyone else, first preference must be given to God and to his word. If we have to receive eternal life, we must follow this. The only place in this world that teaches people to follow this is Zion. It is only here that you will find the children of God who are working towards this goal. Your human teachings have no value. Only the words of God are treasured. Here we seek only God's approval, not the approval of humans. Here we value and strive to fulfill only the plans of God, not the scheme of mortals. Will this be acceptable to people of this world? Never. Because the world cannot accept this. It is not appealing to this world. Therefore, this world will not approve this. 
and Zion does not seek the approval of this world and does not even want any glory from this world. Therefore, beloved, Zion is the only church in the world that loves God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit and Holy Mother more than anyone or anything else. Everyone has to make a choice, an individual choice. Whether you choose to accept this or reject this, it's your choice. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. On the basis of this scripture, many claim we are saved. We have taken a dip three times. We are saved. This kind of salvation is not mentioned here. Those who claim they have already been saved in reality have no clue whatsoever about the salvific plan of God. They have no knowledge about the salvation that the Son of God will give us at His second coming. What is this salvation about? It is clearly mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 that it is a salvation that is kept ready to be revealed in the end times. Who will receive this salvation? Those who have faith. It is not on the basis of your deeds. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Even in his first coming, the first fruits of salvation was bestowed only through faith. And same is also with the fullness of salvation that we are soon going to receive. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Therefore, it is said that those who believe will be saved. And this is not on the basis of your deeds. For this reason, no one can boast before God. So the salvation that God has prepared for us is a gift of God. We receive this by the grace of God only through faith. Each one receives this grace as a gift. Through the faith of the wife, the husband cannot receive eternal life and neither can the faith of the husband lead his wife to eternal life. Everyone who wants to inherit eternal life must have faith and must attain the obedience of faith. Beloved, in Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and 26, we see the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed and through the prophetic writings. To reveal these mysteries, the system prepared by God is the Sadwartha, the good news. Through the Sadwartha, the prophet sent by God revealed the words of God as well as the secrets of the kingdom of God. So why is this being revealed now? Many scriptures testify that it is being revealed to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. Faith comes from what is heard. Therefore, the will of God is that you should hear the Sadwartha, the good news, believe in it and obey it. But in order to believe, you must receive the grace from God and this is given by God. Through her faith, the wife cannot save her husband. Neither can a husband through his faith save his wife. The faith of the parents cannot save their children. Neither can the faith of the children save their parents. Your personal relationship with God has to be above everyone and everything. You must consider all other relationships as secondary. The first commandment is that your God holds the first place in your life. As we read in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14. Even if Noah, Daniel and Job, these three were in it, they would save only their own lives by their righteousness, says the Lord God. 
In this scripture, God is speaking about the end times when the wrath of God will fall upon this earth. Even if these prophets plead before God, they cannot save their parents or their children. By their righteousness, they would only save themselves. Therefore, it is clear that it's each one's responsibility to work out their own salvation and the gift given to each one by God is faith. Every person has to make an individualistic effort to wholeheartedly follow the commandments of God. Only those who know the value of eternal life and who yearn for it will be able to understand these things. But those who are completely satisfied with their lives in this world would never be able to comprehend this. They are content with the wealth and the pleasures of this world. So they have no need of anything else. We read in Sirach chapter 15 verse 14 to 17. It was he who created humankind in the beginning and he left them in the power of their own free choice. If you choose, you can keep the commandments and to act faithfully is a matter of your own choice. He has placed before you fire and water. Stretch out your hands for whichever you choose. Before each person are life and death and whichever one chooses will be given. Therefore, if you wish to inherit the kingdom of God and eternal life, then you must price it highly and strive to achieve it. Acts of the Apostle chapter 3 verse 25. You are the descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and in your descendants all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This scripture has been misinterpreted by many. We have not received the blessing to Isaac who was the offspring of Abraham. God even sent his son to this earth to die as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Yet we have not received this blessing. Jesus Christ is not being belittled here. Neither is he being disdained or rejected. We must first understand what being blessed means. Without knowing the meaning of this word, people are constantly misusing it. It is only through the sadhwarta, the good news, that the meaning of being blessed has been revealed. The messenger who has been sent by God has clearly revealed this. The person free from original sin is considered blessed. In the Garden of Eden, man committed sin and became cursed. We became enslaved to sin, decay, sickness, old age and death. The removal of this curse is a state of being blessed. And if this curse has to be removed, the cause of this curse that is Satan has to be destroyed. Satan has not yet been destroyed. When? And how he will be destroyed has all been written in the Holy Bible. Therefore, by the destruction of Satan, families will be blessed like this. The promise of God will be fulfilled. So Zion is the place that reveals how all the families will be restored and become blessed. It is the only place where all the deeds of God are revealed. What you will hear in Zion has not been preached anywhere else in this world. Therefore, more than any other church, Zion values the relationship in a family because God has revealed his plan concerning a family only to Zion. Therefore, it is not the will of God that the families be scattered, rather that those who have been united by him must live in harmony. Therefore, even Zion desires that both husband and wife must abound in mutual love and live in harmony. Revelations chapter 21 
verse 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. As many Bible scholars have falsely interpreted, this is not an apocalyptic depiction of the atrocities of the Roman Empire. Rather, it is a prophecy that is going to be fulfilled in the end times. See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and the God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. So all these prophecies have yet to be fulfilled. God will dwell with his children. Being set free from death, sorrow and pain, we will live in the presence of God. To prove to you that this prophecy has already started to take form in Zion, I will tell you of one such deed. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 5. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of your tribes as his habitation to put his name there. Beloved, we have already examined this in detail before. What people have been presuming God's name to be is not the name of the Father. The name that God reveals to Moses, I am who I am, even this is not his name. But to the prophets that came later, God revealed that his people would surely know his name. He had promised that he would reveal his most holy name only to his people. In this way, there are many prophecies concerning this. Jesus Christ, through whom we got to know about our Heavenly Father, even he had promised, I will reveal your name to my brothers and sisters. If God had already revealed his name to Moses, there was no need for the Son of God to make this promise. So through Moses, God prophesied concerning a time when his name would be revealed. Therefore, the place that God will choose to establish his name is a place where God will dwell with his people. Beloved, this prophecy has already been fulfilled. The children of God have already built a house that is dedicated to God where the name of God the Father is established. When the children of God entered this house of God for the first time, they entered in with their families. Therefore, God and Zion gives utmost importance to families. From this, it is very clear how much God values the system of a family. Beloved, to the Holy Scriptures, we are only trying to portray before you what God has written concerning a family. Zion has preached about this without adding to the words of God. Zion is the only church that is striving and dedicated to fulfill this plan of God that has been concerning a family. Zion is not breaking families. Rather, it's the only church that is working to fulfill God's plan that is being blessed and with hope is waiting for God to dwell with them. Therefore, it is just as Jesus Christ has said, not everyone can accept this teaching, but only those to whom it is given. Therefore, I pray that the children of God may receive the gift to understand the word of God, to comprehend the secrets of the kingdom of God and to understand the plans and dreams of God. Amen.